This will represent part three of a multi-part series where we're looking at the influences of vertical wind shear and specifically how is this driven by synoptic scale processes as just another ingredient, vertical wind shear being part of a, the important ingredients for severe storms in addition to lapse rates, low level moisture, and sources for lift. So here we'll focus on vertical wind shear driven by the large scale weather systems. Okay, synoptic contributions to vertical wind shear. When we talk about this, we're primarily referring to what we call a baroclinic weather system. That just means that we still have temperature advection going on. It's not every, it is not completely balanced, so there's a lot of changes in the profile. So in this case, warm advection, through a little bit of hand waving, we get to veering winds with height, and it's a thermal wind argument. And the point is, a veering wind with height gives you a favorable wind shear profile for severe storms and specifically supercells. We'll, in other uh, later presentations, we'll get into the details of how that relates to supercell potential. But in this case, background warm advection is a good profile for the right kind of wind structure to favor supercell storms. And then cold advection is just the opposite. It's it, the curvature of the hodograph is actually the opposite. And then there's also, we have lee cyclogenesis across the Great Plains. Secondarily, you can get this in the lee of any range, like the Appalachians, but it's primarily central United States is where this is most relevant. It acts like a warm core low. The warm air descends down the east slope of the mountains. The warming induces lower pressure, conservation of absolute vorticity, and we can end up with creating a cyclone or a trough that induces a veering wind profile with height and also the differential advection that results in that loaded gun profile, like you saw in the elapsed rate case, looking at the May 3rd, 99 example from Norman. Okay, cyclogenesis. It's sort of a multi-step process, and we'll just go through it here, and I'll show you just an example of a large-scale deepening cyclone and you know, how that feeds back to the severe storm environment. If we have a deepening cyclone, we have pressure falls, that induces mass flux. So we've got mass influx into the area of lowering pressure, if there are pre-existing fronts, which there usually are with cases of strong cyclogenesis, any sort of increase in the mass flux increases the thermal advections and increases the potential for ascent. This is related to quasi-geostrophic processes, and we will discuss that uh, separately. Deepening cyclone, we also get strengthening vertical shear, differential advections. You can start to see the pattern here. It's a positive feedback is what happens if you have the lapse rate and moisture sources in proximity to the deepening cyclone. And then if you get this all to work right, you end up with a favorable environment for severe storms. Okay, so we're gonna step through uh, over a few days, a strong cyclogenesis event in the upper Midwest and a downstream severe weather outbreak. We see strong jet streak. This is a loft, we're looking at 300 millibars moving into the Pacific Northwest coast, very strong jet, strong exit region. This continues over a couple of days to the east southeast and you can see the entire system amplifies and then we'll look down with time lower and lower in the troposphere to see how it evolves. So again, strong jet streak aloft, that by itself would be a source for vertical motion in the exit region of the jet, which we will talk about some in a separate presentation. But if we look in the low levels, this is down at 500 millibars, so pretty uh, standard. Most people would look at this, you see the amplification of a strong wave and then a deep occluded cyclone forms. The important thing is you notice how much the winds increase. You know, you go from over, the winds are in the 60, 70 knot range with the system. And then you look by morning, we have winds in excess of 100 knots over in to Missouri, Illinois. And this continues as the cyclone, even 115 knots at Detroit which is there in southeast lower Michigan. So we, we've created much stronger flow, stronger gradients related to the cyclogenesis. And the important thing for severe storms is how does that coincide with the warm sector? So again, we jump down to 850 millibars, which is just a few thousand feet above the ground. You see strong cyclone develops. Now by this point in the morning of our severe weather event, strong front, but look at the gradient. What's happened over in the Ohio Valley, the winds in the low levels are now 60 plus knots out of the south southwest and they've gone from you know 15 to 30 knot winds now we've got a broad area of 60 knot flow which is in response to this tightening height and pressure gradients related to the deepening cyclone 
and then this occludes up over the uh, northern Minnesota. So then here's the surface maps, what that looks like. So we're, we have a initially Lee Cyclone in Montana. The moisture, these are in the greens, are 60 dew points out here. So it's relatively moist. This is an October case. Synoptic cyclone begins to develop in the Dakotas. This moves eastward into Minnesota, Iowa, and deepens. And then we have an occlusion process with the low. So this is a case that starts as a Lee cyclone and then develops eastward with the synoptic wave. Now the important thing is with this cold front surge, we have strengthening even down to the surface, the winds increase. This also draws the dew points in the 60s all the way up almost to lower Michigan. With all the strong flow in the troposphere, you might expect something interesting to happen if you can co-locate that moistening with the increase in vertical shear. And this is an example of what happened. This is the Nashville sounding kind of on the southeast side that wasn't contaminated by convection too much. This is what it looked like the evening before. And you notice here, I'm gonna go from a 0Z to a 12Z sounding and show the destabilization. With the synoptic processes, you can see this. It does, it's not all related to daytime heating. So that's the evening before, this is the morning of. We've actually transferred more moisture into Nashville and if you look at what's happened with the winds, they have also increased, oops, they've increased and the hodograph has increased in size and curvature and we've created a low cape, high shear type environment for severe storms and I kind of gave away the answer. There ended up being a large severe weather outbreak with widespread damaging winds, tornadoes embedded in a squall line, and there were even some supercells in this as well. The point here is that you could anticipate this as long as you know your moisture re source regions. In this case, we didn't have the lapse rates. They were not particularly steep, but we had very strong cyclogenesis and sufficient moisture close by so that not all severe weather events require dry diabetic mid-level lapse rates, but if everything else is there, we can still see a four squall line with widespread severe weather. So the, that's the important point here is that if you understand cyclogenesis, you can anticipate favorable environments, especially when you combine that information with the source regions for the moisture and lapse rate, which is what drives the buoyancy. So as long as we don't have a warm sector that's completely modified, you're gonna see veering winds with height and warm advection in most cases. And then the more baroclinic the wave, the stronger the gradients, the stronger the infections, the stronger the ascent, potentially the stronger the cyclogenesis. But again, there, there are all of these are competing factors where you also have to consider the moisture. An intense cyclone with no substantial moisture or buoyancy is not much of a sewer weather risk. We see a lot of those in the winter and at northern latitudes, but it's when you can co-locate these baroclinic waves with a reasonable moist sector is when bad things start to happen in the warm sector. And then of course, again, that mass response, differential advection and vertical shear. So it's, it's the holistic process that you have to look at is there's not just one thing that you can focus on. You wanna to try to get the entire process down. So if you want upstream source regions, cyclogenesis, mass response, and what that does to the wind profiles and how it redistributes the temperature and moisture in a manner that favors severe storm development.